it was closed. Been closed since March. We were open for like a two week period when we had some PPP funding to help us go, but we just weren't able to get the attendance. Part of the problem is we're indoors. We're a, a place where kids and families touch everything. And it's like two things that you kind of don't want to do during COVID time is touch things and be inside. And we're like, ah, this is killing us. So attendance was hard. And the board took a moment and said, let's, let's close the center and refresh it and rehab it. It's in need of some rehab. We had some state money that we were able to get grant funds from last year. So we're going through and renovating all the first floor with new exhibits, new carpet, new paints. Uh, we're going to be relighting the cube again. We're going to be putting on some signage on the outside. Looks good. We're going to put some fencing around the parking lot to help kind of keep people out at nighttime and those kind of things. Uh, and so we're, we're doing a rehab uh, and it's going to take us a while, uh, but I think the way things are looking, it's going to be a while before a center like the Cube could really be open and the public will be ready uh, to receive us. And so looking at the great downtown, and you can see how they went outdoors to try to bring the traffic in. And that's exactly what we need to be working on too. So while we're looking and rehabbing, actually rehabbing the center, we also want to go outside. There's a major grant that is an opportunity for the Cube to do in December. And the part of this, I have to go out and talk to the community and you know, make sure there's some support out there from the community saying, hey, we'd love to have the cube open again and being outdoors makes sense. So I just have a quick couple of slides to show you and just to see if there's any feedback on it. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen real quick uh, and uh, get to it. Let me see here, start the broadcast. Okay, hopefully everybody can see the screen and uh, we're the cube. So uh, the yes, area so that we we're talking about Okay, thank you, uh, is the parking lot uh, of the Cube. So we're, we're between Main Street and Broadway and along the creek, you can see the Santiago Creek there. And so there's a little sliver of parkland between us and the, and the creek. And some areas it's 10 feet wide, some areas it gets up to 20 feet. And we're looking to work with, and the, uh, the idea would be to help take over that space there to bring exhibits outside and to take over the whole parking lot that we have on this section and create a covered zone. Something like this, this is just kind of a, a artist concepts right now, but the inside would be, a, it's a covered pavilion. So it's not an indoor building, it's supposed to be open air, giant open airs like this open space would be maybe 30 or 40 feet high so we can get an open space, but we do need it covered to protect the exhibits and the content that's inside there and to make it basically be able to last um, through the year in all kinds of weather. The other part would be to look at the property that's there right now. There's plenty of homeless camps. If you've walked the area, uh, probably you haven't because it's a little scary to walk that area, uh, but there are tents there. Um, the homeless have definitely found a refuge in the space because it's, it's, there's a fence all along the parking lot of the cube that really provides them kind of a quiet zone. Not, not a lot of people go next to it. So we've been talking to the city about potentially being able to use that area and do all types of programming. We're kind of coming up with all types of areas, a fire ranger station, especially after the fires this week. Like, hmm, that might be a good thing to talk about. This concept has a mini golf zone, but there's all, all types. We're still floating around and coming up with what the area is. But part of what we would do is we would take the walls of the creek, the existing walls, and go up to the level where the current bike trail is and basically fill it in, which would give us more space to have more of a park. Right now, it's all kind of fallen off to the edge. And so there's just kind of, it's a skinny land where the, um, the bike trail is. Um, so a couple of questions that we'd like to kind of uh, put out there is one, if an outdoor science park uh, would be supported in the community, would it also be supported to have a, a, a pavilion that's covered, uh, but basically an open air pavilion adjacent to the outdoor space? Um, that's the second area. And then the third question for us is to look at the edges of the, of the existing uh, creek and if uh, we could get support by actually building up this zone so we can actually have more space to do things in the outdoor area. Um, and the third and last thing is uh, the bike path, just kind of getting a feeling of, to keep the bike path or not keep the bike path between Maine and Broadway. And so we're talking to different community groups saying, do you use the bike path? Um, if we kept it, would you use the bike path or in the current condition, uh, would you not? So those are 
kind of uh, feedback areas. And then the last thing, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Oh, let me go one more screen over, is that we are a voting center. So the Cube has 36 stations going on. And on Friday, we're going to open up to the public. So this is going to be one of the largest voting centers around. Uh, to be able to provide um, a big open space for people to come into. So we're excited about doing that for the community. Okay, let me find a way to stop sharing the screen and come back around to everybody. So what do you think? Could we get support from the community for an outdoor science park and a, and a pavilion that would be covered that we can bring exhibits into? Is that something that seems doable to the community. Speaking for myself, yes. <laughs> I like your layout. I like what you're what you're doing with that really vacant land right now, filling it in and put it into good good use. So I say yes. Thanks, Any Carl. other board members? Well, I live in Floral Park, Joe. This is Christina Romero, and I have twin boys that are 10 years old, 10 and a half, and I support the use of this land as a resident of Santa Ana. I think it's innovative. I think it will allow for a multi-use space, and I think it will actually serve as hopefully a um, way for other businesses to be inspired um, to utilize outdoor space, um, especially those that are not restaurants. So I support it. Thanks, Christina. And your boys are definitely our target audience. So <laughs> yes, they know that the, the moms they, we want to hear from. Yeah. We know that the Discovery Science Center is closed and they know, and we're reminded all the time when we're <laughs> stuck in the house. <laughs> oh, no. well, we also have, have Julie uh, uh, Castle Cardinetis say, said yes also. Okay. Well, thank you. And if you have other questions or, or you know, want to ping me, I'll be watching here and definitely available. Um, uh, my email is jadams at discoverycube.org. And so please do feel free to email me and, and let me know your thoughts. That's great. One last question. How are you financially surviving this downtime? It's tough, Carl. It's very tough right now. So we had 300 employees uh, before March, we had to lay off about 96% of them. So we've kept a um, kind of a small group now that works on the capital projects for the renovations. Um, we have a core group of, ex of teachers that are doing programming for Santa Ana Unified's after school program. So all kids kind of in the uh, uh, fifth grade um, are going through our after school program in Santa Ana Unified. So that helps kind of keep the funding for some of the teacher programs, but it's it's pretty thin right now. I'll just add another, yes, uh, Mary Lou Branch uh, just uh, sent a message to me saying that she says yes, as far as proceeding with this project. Is there anything we can do to you, write letters, or is there anything you need from us? Um, I'll ask the grant, uh, Christina, you're experiencing grants too. That might be a great idea of getting the community uh, support letter. So I'll check in and get back to you. But thank you, Carl, for offering that. That would be, that's, I think that'd be very idea. helpful. Well, thank you, everybody. Hope you, if you haven't voted already, we hope to see you at the voting polls at the Cube. <laughs> As someone that runs a, a, a booth, 36, you have 36 spots that you're... 36. Uh, you're, you're about three times my size. So that is... <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Joe. We appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Yes. Okay, thanks. We'll be back open. We're going to get there. Okay. Um, our next topic is that we're going to have an update from the executive director, Christine Romero, and acting president, Marilyn Flores, on what's going on at uh, Santa Ana College. So, ladies, would you like to take it from me? Yes. Sure. Have Dr. Flores uh, start this presentation from Santa Ana College and allow her the time to um, present a few major points and updates about the college and introduce herself. Uh, Dr. Flores is not new to Rancho Santiago Community College District. Uh, she served as Vice President of Academic Affairs at Santiago Canyon College. And we are so grateful, sincerely, to have Dr. Flores serve as Interim President at Santa Ana College. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marilyn Flores. 
Thank you. I think she said it all. <laughs> no, um, uh, and I, and thank you so much for having um, both Christine and I here and allowing us the opportunity to provide you with updates on the college and really want to keep you in the know of what's going on. And so right now I am the interim president uh, for Santa Ana College. As you know, Dr. Linda Rose, who dedicated many years to Santa Ana College, did choose to retire. And so she's living the life of luxury. <laughs> And so um, the college will be doing a nationwide search um, for a permanent president and to come on board beginning July 1st of 2021. So in the meantime, I will be serving as the interim. And to give you some updates with the college, I will let you know that we are, we are still fully enrolled. Um, our enrollment is a bit down as it is with most of the community colleges in the region. Uh, while most of our classes are being taught remotely or online, we do have about 100 sections, a little bit over 100 sections that we still offer in a face-to-face -face environment. And those are really in the key essential workforce areas or and what we like to call um, hard to transition to online format courses. And so those occur in our police academies, our nursing program, our diesel, our welding, um, some of our chemistry and biology courses. In addition to that, most recently, we just added about five sections, and I know that doesn't sound like a lot, um, but based on the guidelines, uh, the CDC guidelines for us to be able to, uh, to allow face-to-face, -face, we've added about five sections in general education. So we have a math class, an astronomy class, an accounting class, um, and they sit in a room that has about 100 plus capacity, and we only have 20, 20 to 25 students per se in a classroom in order for us to abide by the CDC guidelines. So they have social distancing, they have to wear masks, the classrooms are sanitized on a daily basis, um, and we have all PPEs provided um, should a student or an instructor or even a staff member not have them present. Um, in addition to that, we have added what we call our great weeks, which are our, our accelerated eight weeks courses in several areas. Again, as face-to-face -face where possible and in, um, what we call remote live courses and online. Um, as far as anything else that we're doing, we have a partnership with the city of Santa Ana in providing free COVID testing to the community. And that happens face-to-face uh, -face every Wednesday and Thursday. And we also do drive-through COVID testing. So if you haven't heard about that, feel free to sign up. Um, the plan is supported by the city and it's basically based if you live, if you work or if you're learned in the city of Santa Ana, you can take as many tests as you want. You can repeat taking the test. And again, it's free. And we are fortunate to have the pain-free one. Um, so um, the swab is in your nose. It doesn't go all the way up to your brain as some people describe it. Um, and so that's available to you. In addition to that, we are using our small gym um, for voting as well. And then we also have a blood drive coming up soon. Uh, last week, we held our first board of trustees meeting in a face-to-face -face environment. We held it in our gym. And so that was a, a, for us a big deal because we were able to provide it virtually and face-to-face -face as well. And we had about 18, 19 uh, folks in attendance and we were able to have our closed sessions face-to-face um, -face, as well as having those board members that chose not to come or unable to come in person. They joined us via Zoom. Um, other than that, I could probably go on and on about what we're doing at the college, but more importantly, I really wanted to turn it over to Christina about a really important project that we have and a fundraising effort that we need help at all levels um, in all monetations, um, focusing on raising, it's a raising the game campaign. She'll go into detail, but please know that it makes a difference for all of our students because amidst the pandemic, not only do they have to worry about that, but they also have to worry about financially, how are they going to continue to pursue their education? So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and to Christina Romero. And as you know, she's our executive director for the Office of College Advancement. Christina. Thank you so much, Dr. Flores. And I'm excited to share my screen and jump right into what we just had as an introduction to our philanthropic campaign, which is definitely why I'm here and I appreciate um, the opportunity. I'm just going to go right to that and we'll begin. Okay. So Dr. Flores already went through a few of the things uh, that I'm going to mention. So I'm not going to mention that. I am going to tell you that as a resident of Santa Ana, I share 
um, similar values in what Comlink is about and why it matters. And so these are my twin boys here on the right, um, Gavin and Emmett. And this is my house um, here in Floral Park. And so I think that- Yeah, I'm not seeing your screen. Is oh, it just me? Not? Oh, no. uh, Chris, yeah, Christina, we can't see your screen. So. Okay, let's see. I didn't- I want to see those boys. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> so where do I go? I At the bottom, if you go to the bottom, there's a share screen. Um, okay. Here we go. There. Here we go. Okay, I'm sorry. Excellent. Okay, so, we've got it now. We've got it now. Here we go. So I'll pretend that that didn't happen. I appreciate this time. Um, I am a resident of Santa Ana, also a Santa Ana College alum, and uh, Dr. Flores did mention, obviously, and I've introduced myself, uh, Christina Romero, Executive Director of Advancement. I look forward every day to connecting with our stakeholders, our community, and I have twin boys. Um, my family and I live in Santa Ana in Floral Park, and I share um, a similar value with many of the residents and stakeholders on this call. So I just want you to know that I feel deeply connected to the work that you do and the things that you care about. And I wanted to start with that because I think it's really important. Um, Dr. Flores mentioned all of that. I did want to say that Santa Ana College is here for the community. At the same time, what's really important and intrinsic is that the community and Santa Ana College need each other. And our students need our community in order to continue thriving. Our students um, are able to take over uh, the opportunities of over 89 programs. And we have many certificate programs, AA degree programs and transfer programs. We're one of the only community colleges in the state of California along with another 15 that offer a bachelor's degree in occupational therapy. And of course, our students are diverse and hardworking and 64% of them are part-time learners and we offer over 490 course selections and they meet, of course, every single day of the week in a non-COVID environment. Our Santa Ana College Advancement Office needs our community to know about the inspirational ways that you can help transform our students' lives in a philanthropic way. We have undertaken a very uh, diverse and dynamic uh, fundraising effort and we are calling it the Raising the Game campaign. Currently, our foundation has grown threefold um, since 2006. We are now uh, an $11 million asset foundation because of generosity of stakeholders, community leaders, alumni, foundation. So we wanna thank everybody. I know I have some President Circle members on the call. Thank you um, everybody for the scholarship work that you do in your neighborhood associations. Every day, especially during, during COVID, we have been reminded of the enthusiasm and the support that continues for Santa Ana College Foundation work, and so we thank you. But we're here to do more work, and I'm here to enthusiastically tell you that um, we want you to choose Santa Ana College. We want you to talk about Santa Ana College, not just because of the amazing academic programs that we have and the ways that we can change people's lives in post-secondary education, but also the way that I know you are aware that you can change somebody's life through the power of scholarship or program support. And we have beautiful facilities that I'm gonna talk really quickly about, but I'm just gonna go over the three campaign initiatives. We're going to focus on student success scholarships, higher award amount scholarships, scholarships that are focused in CTE, career technology areas. Um, we have so many degrees and programs that can change the life of a student within a two year period. And I just want you to know that if you have two students that are starting at the same time and one student is part-time working, trying to juggle their family and their work and the other student is able to work significantly less or not at all, in four semesters, the student who is full-time is three times more likely to continue at Santa Ana College and successfully complete their degree. And that's where the power of scholarship comes in. So if you know anybody who's received a scholarship, if you yourself have received a scholarship, I know that you know the testimony and the power of scholarship. We also are here to tell you that community colleges have an amazing opportunity and challenge. We accept 100% of our applicants, which means nobody is turned away at Santa Ana College or any other community college in the state of California. That pre presents that opportunity, but also that challenge of making sure that there's enough faculty and staff ratio to really engage our students. 
We know that private universities and other universities with more funding are able to deeply connect with students and keep them on the path. So our second initiative of proven high impact programs is here to try and facilitate more funding in areas where we know that our programs work. We have many uh, community-based programs on campus where these learning communities have really basically changed the trajectory of our students. And last but not least, I want you to know that we have an amazing set of fine and performing arts faculty and students that are from 3D animation to theater arts. We have a beautiful outdoor amphitheater and we want more of our community to be able to enjoy the arts and we do need uh, a minimum of uh, funding to continue the types of fine and performing arts that you, our community members, and our students deserve. So I am transparently asking you to be a part of this in whatever way that you see fit, an ambassador, a donor, somebody who wants to come and take a tour, you want to invite somebody to come and take a tour, please think about the power that you have as a neighbor, as a community member, and as a, a person that knows our college. We are seeking the support of individuals like yourself. You can start a scholarship fund in somebody's honor. You can join together and, and join forces with three and six or 12 more people and, and start a scholarship fund. You can give a one-time gift just to show your support or you can come onto our campus and see our brick campaign and leave a legacy. You can put your will or state together and think about the impact that your community college has made in your life. Um, or think about how Santa Ana College is part of your community. And maybe you'd like to talk to us about a planned gift. But here's some exciting stuff that I also wanna share with you because a lot of our uh, neighbors like yourself and stakeholders are not able to come onto our campus or haven't thought about it, but I, I welcome you to call me and we can give you a tour. To the, to the top of this screen, you're gonna see our brand new Student Services Johnson Center. This is huge. We have a facility that's coming that will allow individual students to be able to congregate and connect. And we are really excited about it. There are um, murals that are actually uh, going to be here on uh, the building that are actually from our Santa Ana College uh, mural department. And on the bottom, of your screen, you're seeing our brand new science center that is almost complete. Um, this will obviously create world-class facilities uh, for our academic programs. And we will have nating opportunities around these buildings and also a way for everybody to get involved. We hope to have some beautiful open houses in 21 and 22. So please know that your community college is a place that you should feel proud. And our students also um, really are appreciative of those spaces. So these are our board members, Alberta, who you know, who is a fearless leader, and many of our board members have dedicated their time, and I just wanted to uh, let you know that it's these leaders, as well as myself, that are available to you to answer questions, um, to allow you to give in a way that makes sense and is connected to your passion. I know that time is so valuable, and so I just want to say that I'm grateful for this time with you, and I will tell you that if I had more time with you, I would play inspirational videos of students who literally have been brought to tears when they receive a scholarship. We have students that go to institutions of transfer from uh, Harvard University to Berkeley um, to medical schools across this country, as well as UCI and Cal State Fullerton, amazing local uh, universities. And we also have welders, automotive technology specialists, 3D animators, um, and entrepreneurs that leave Santa Ana College and change the lives of our economy. So thank you for this time. I hope you will raise your game um, so that more students can raise theirs. And I hope that you'll reach out to me so that you can become a part of our philanthropic family. Thanks again. Wow. Thank you, thank you Christina. Well, thank you. I, yeah, I just like to add one thing and your planetarium over there. It's yes. great to take your grandchildren, your kids, even yourself. I. I very much enjoyed when we had the uh, anniversary, the uh, Apollo moonshot, the program that was put on in the planetarium. It is really, really neat. So if another reason, find out when the planetarium is open and, and go. Your grandchildren will enjoy it. You'll, you'll enjoy it.
Absolutely. We have a lot of gems on Sunana College's campus. We don't want to be the best known secret. We want to be an open door to our community. And um, we don't want COVID to stop the engagement. Uh, Dr. Flores is more than willing and has already jumped in to be on phone calls and meetings that will allow uh, stakeholders to be involved. And I can't say enough about how grateful our students are. Every single time we have students in front of individuals like yourself, really there's nothing left to say except that they're our future and it's an honor to work with them and for them. And so I know that this group will definitely be involved in our Raising the Game campaign. I can feel your energy even through this virtual space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Christina, I can tell you uh, firsthand, my oldest son um, went through, we live down San Juan Capistrano because my wife runs the mission down here. And uh, we went to Saddleback. He went to Saddleback for the first two years. It was great. And then from there, we jumped off and uh, he went to Berkeley, got, finished up his degree, and now he's a planner for the city of Los Angeles. So the power of the uh, community colleges is, is, is awesome. I yeah. totally believe in it. And yeah. I didn't understand it. I didn't come from California initially. So I had to learn what the school, the state has done in that world. And it's, it's a very great tool. It's an awesome tool. So congratulations. And I would take you up on getting a tour of that science building. So uh, sign me up. Yes. Let's go, let's go <laughs> check I'll let it you out. know that, that, you know, as with all construction projects, we have hiccups. So it will be opening in the spring, potentially. We'll have to move in in the summer for both of those buildings. Um, as it as is with the uh, Discovery Cube, the planetarium right now is not open as well because of COVID. Again, it's a small, closed, dark space. And so um, our goal, though, is to, as we start to transition, that we'll try, try to create those experiences as well. And our commitment to the community um, continues. Um, one thing that, that, I, that I failed to mention is that I am a proud mother of two boys as well. One is a freshman in high school and was in, one is a freshman in college. And because of my passion, both know community college. And so my freshman in college is going to Santiago Canyon College. Um, as I was there before and wherever I'm at, he will continue to go just because we all believe, the family believes in my heart is at the community colleges. And it really is because of our connections to the community. Um, if we don't have that connections to the community, we do are doing a disservice, not just to our students, but to the community we serve. So I'm really glad to be here to share with you all of the good work that we do and the continued partnerships that we hope to flourish. Very good. We appreciate ha having you and taking the time to be with us and also you, you Joe. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna move on to Catherine Downs, who's gonna talk about the financials uh, uh, of the city, especially with the upcoming year and uh, all the changes that uh, are seen to be taking place day by day. So uh, Catherine, can you tell us how the city's doing and what we, Hope to see. Sure. So uh, can you see the first slide of my presentation? Yes. OK, great. Um, so thank you, uh, Comling Board, for allowing me to present the budget this evening um, to be in compliance with the city's sunshine ordinance. I appreciate it. Tonight, I will cover a quick summary of the city's budget, the strategic plan goals, our financial outlook, the federal funding we received for COVID response, that's the CARES Act money, measure X spending and capital projects. So let's get started with the budget overview. The city's fiscal year starts in July and ends in June. And that's why we always have two numbers associated with our fiscal year. So this would be July, 2020 through June, 2021. The general fund is our primary operating budget and accounts for roughly half of our citywide budget. General revenue is unrestricted, meaning there are no spending restrictions on it and it can be used for any purpose. Normally, our annual general revenue should be more than 320 million. You can see at the top of the slide there that we're expecting only 307 million and that's because COVID is affecting our revenue. So sales tax, hotel visitors tax, and business tax have all decreased. Here you can see that our sales tax and property tax comprise more than half of our general fund revenue. This includes Measure X money. 
the original estimate that we had for Measure X was $60 million per year. Last fiscal year, we received nearly 62 million, but with COVID in mind, we've reduced the current year estimate to 55 million. With new development, our tax base increases. So I wanted to give you an idea of how newly developed projects affect our general fund revenue. Here's an example of a mixed use building planned for third and Broadway in downtown. So when you combine the property tax, sales tax, and other taxes, we expect this development may generate more than $700,000 of tax revenue each year. This is a very generic example of a fast food restaurant, which may generate annual tax revenue of about $20,000 per year. So these are just a couple examples of how new development projects generate revenue for the city. Our general fund expenditure budget is 325.9 million. Now that's 18.5 million more than what we expect to receive this year. So we're using accumulated fund balance, or you could think of it as our savings account to maintain existing services for now, but that's just a one-time solution. That's using one-time money. Public safety, both police and fire, comprises half of our general fund spending. So next year, we expect that we might have to make a few changes to rebalance the budget. In the last few slides, I focused on the general fund. This here is a snapshot of our citywide budget, which includes all of our restricted funds too. This means that the money comes with spending restrictions. For example, we can only spend water utility fees on water pipelines and water services. We also have budgets for grants and capital projects, all restricted money. Here I've listed some of the budget highlights for the year. So we know that revenue has decreased due to COVID and we're using one-time money to maintain service levels. However, we did set aside some money for a parks master plan, the Universal Legal Defense Fund, the Family Justice Center, a citywide parking plan and homeless services. We also added 26 full-time positions to address youth services and right-of-way maintenance. However, due to COVID, we have been cautious and we haven't filled those positions yet. They remain vacant. Okay. And then finally, the city council continues to set aside two thirds of our cannabis tax revenue for youth uh, and services and enforcement. As just a reminder, and that two thirds is 6.8 million expected this year. This is a snapshot of the city's full-time employee positions. You can see that half of them are in the police department. When you combine our frontline departments providing direct service to the community, like the police and public works and parks, recreation and community services, library, et cetera, you can account for almost 1,100 of the 1,200 funded positions. Next, I'll provide a brief overview of the five-year strategic plan adopted by City Council this year. The plan was developed with community input, interviews with City Council members, and a workshop with executive management. The five strategic goals listed here are financial stability, which of course is my favorite one, community safety, modern facilities and infrastructure, efficient cities services, and economic diversification and expansion. So within each of these strategic goals, we have specific goals for each department. And we take these goals seriously. Uh, for example, the city manager will evaluate my own performance based on my finance department goals that support these strategic plan goals. So the full document is available on the city's website. Next, I wanna cover financial planning and the city's financial outlook. Our top five general revenues comprise about two thirds of our operating budget. These include the sales tax, property tax, utility users tax, and, and cannabis tax. And of course, Measure X is also a form of sales tax. 
So although we expect the decrease in sales tax due to the pandemic, we expect an increase in utility users tax due to people spending more time at home. It's not enough to offset the sales tax loss, but it does help. Property tax revenue is based on property valuation done by the county in the prior year. So we think that COVID will affect our property tax revenue next year. The city only receives 17% of that 1% base property tax levy that you pay. The remaining 83% goes to schools and county agencies. I know uh, some folks are interested in understanding how Proposition 15 might impact our property tax revenue at the city. Um, we haven't really done any studies on that, although I do know that um, the Blue Sky Consulting Group hired by Schools and Communities First did, did a study um, and they've put an estimate that you can find out on the internet, but I don't know how accurate that estimate is. So at this time, I really don't know um, what kind of an impact there would be as a result of Proposition 15. I know it would be positive, but it probably would take a few years to uh, be implemented because if Proposition 15 passes, it's gonna take a while for the county assessors to go around and reassess all the properties. Our cannabis tax revenue is holding steady, but again, keep in mind that two thirds of this is set aside for youth services and enforcement. And my light just turned off. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm sitting too still. Okay, so we have a, a 10 year outlook that we prepare each year. The outlook is a tool, it's not a projection. What we do is we take the current budget structure we apply some assumptions to it and we see the potential outcome. We use the tool to look ahead and recommend changes to the budget to avoid a negative outcome. The assumptions I've listed here on the slide, um, we only focus on recurring revenues and expenditures. As I mentioned previously, we expect COVID will affect our property tax revenue next year. So for now, we're assuming a $4.8 million reduction in revenue for that item. And that's based on our experience after the Great Recession of 2008-2009. We've also included future items we know about, like increasing pension costs, paying off the debt for the police building, and the scheduled reduction of the Measure X sales tax rate. So here is the visual result of that outlook print, that's printed in our budget document. The outlook indicates that we will need to make some changes to put the budget back into balance. The orange line is expenditures and the blue line is revenue. You can visually see the decrease of the Measure X sales tax rate in 2029. That would be that dip towards the right side of the blue line. Because timing and impact is uncertain, the outlook does not include new revenue sources such as naming rights, or development projects that have the potential to bring in more tax revenue. Those are both solutions that may help us balance the budget in the future. I've included some thoughts about the city's financial future here on this slide. So we're looking at new revenues and we're evaluating services to rebalance the budget and promote efficiencies. Our latest information indicates that property tax and sales tax our two largest revenue sources will perform a little bit better this year than what we previously estimated. And the city recently negotiated a higher rate with the US Marshals, increasing our jail revenue by approximately 1.5 million per year. We have programs such as workforce investment that are no longer sustainable with the limited amount of restricted money we receive. So we're gonna to need to look at potentially providing a general fund subsidy in the future to keep those programs running or reimagining how we provide that service to the community. The train station also needs a subsidy from the general fund. So overall, we have a shrinking economy and yet government service is still in high demand. We're exploring options to refinance our debt for employee pensions. So that's one way we can potentially save money. Um, I wanted to go over the uh, CARES Act spending plan. We received 28.6 million of federal money. This was passed through to us by the state. 
Uh, here's This is a snapshot of the spending plan, which was approved by city council. You'll notice on the left side, there's a, uh, a blue area for the contingency of revenue recovery. Now that has not been approved by the federal government. We were holding out hope that it would be, but it has not been. So uh, at this time, we cannot use this revenue to backfill our general fund. Um, but our spending plan does include the services associated with the CARES mobile program that's been going out to neighborhoods sanitization, clinical and modeling services, and of course, assistance programs to residents, businesses, and nonprofits. The money comes with a lot of spending restrictions. Um, and per federal guidelines, uh, the money must be spent by December 30th. We also have a spending plan for Measure X because this is another topic that a lot of people are interested in. We've categorized the expenditures using the original ballot language here. A large portion is for general purposes that of course include increased costs on some of our contracts, tree trimming, a bus shelter program, and funding for the Universal Legal Defense Fund. We have another large portion there to retain police officers. We know it's very difficult to hire police officers without competitive compensation. After receiving the Measure X allocation, the police chief was able to hire 50 additional officers last year. We also have allocations for maintaining effective 911 response, retaining firefighters, addressing homelessness, youth services, and maintaining parks. Finally, this is a summary of our capital spending for this year. The city primarily uses the restricted money it gets for capital improvements, so we don't use much general fund money at, at all, any. And the 75 million allocation this year will pay for street improvements, water and sewer pipelines, bike lanes, and park improvements. You can find the entire capital improvement plan on the city's website. So I wanted to thank you for listening. That's the end of my prepared presentation. I hope you found it useful. And now I'd like to take the opportunity to answer your questions if you have any. Okay. If anyone wishes to raise their hand or to uh, put in a question, we sure would, would appreciate it. Um, on it. I, I guess there's a lot of question. My main question is, I guess there's a lot of question marks uh, and the effect of COVID. If it goes away quick, quickly in the spring, as they keep saying month to month, uh, change ballparks. If it stays, I guess we're looking for more gloom. That is that is true. The um, Our budget, S, uh, our revenue estimates for the year basically take into account that we think that COVID will still be impacting um, the economy through the end of the fiscal year, meaning June of 2021. Um, so, and we, the city council adopts a budget one year at a time. Peter Katz, do you have any questions to add? You got to un uh, unmute yourself, Peter, we can't hear you. There you go. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of unanswered questions because we don't know where this uh, revenue is going to come from. And so we have a lot of unanswered questions in here of, of what is going to happen uh, with pension reform and with tax revenue. If Proposition 15 doesn't pass, then, then you're behind the eight ball even further. But that 10-year projection of those numbers, there has to be a way to bring those two figures closer over that 10-year period. And uh, Catherine, I don't know what the solution is. How do you attempt to approach that on a long-term proposal? But you have to start now. We, we can't wait 10 years and find ourselves further behind the April. I agree. And there is no silver bullet solution. So it's going to be a bunch of small solutions, like the fact that we, you know, we expect to get another 1.5 million in jail revenue. And thankfully, uh, we were very conservative in our revenue estimates. And so it's looking like, you know, property tax and sales tax are going to do a little bit better. If Proposition 15 does not pass, um, there are other revenue sources out there that we can pursue, like naming rights. And, um, you know, the, we can 
um, continue using a little bit of reserves, not much, but there may be the opportunity to use a little bit of reserves to continue preserving our existing service levels until new development projects come through. Um, but for the most part, we're gonna have to find some savings, which means reimagining how we provide services, um, changing the levels of service. And then of course, I've got my own personal um, project of uh, refinancing that pension debt. Um, so I'm, I'm scheduled to present to the city council on that, all of their options uh, in December uh, and my recommendations about what that might look like. And one other question, what about, uh, have you considered uh, electronic uh, uh, advertising messaging boards throughout the city that can be sold to commercial enterprises? I do believe that. Food? Yeah, I believe that that has been under consideration, and I, I don't know the status of that. That That's a uh, public works initiative, but I can certainly find out more. Thank you. Uh, Leon, do you, do you have any questions for Catherine? Not at this time. Okay. Thank All you. right. Um, Catherine, industry has faced their pension problems by bringing in 401ks, mm -hmm. uh, what have you. Do you see the state at, I know this is not an issue the city can handle by itself. It's going to take the state help. But is there any talk in the state about reform? Because these numbers are just growing and growing and growing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. They are growing. Um, it's something that concerns me. Uh, it's something that I've put a lot of effort into studying. The... Uh, in the state of California, we have something called the California rule. And it basically says that when an employee is hired or when, you know, especially for um, governmental agencies, when an employee is hired and a promise is made, like let's say you tell them you're going to make $20 an hour and you are going to earn um, such and such pension formula. Even for prospective service, meaning years that they haven't even put in yet. The California rule is, is law, it's, it's state statute that basically says that if you are going to change those benefits that you told that employee that you would provide to them when you hired them, you will have to replace it with some kind of like kind benefit. So it's not really a way to save money because you end up having to spend it in a different way to replace it with something of equivalent value. And that California rule has been challenged several times over the last several years. There's, there's a couple different cases that I'm very familiar with and the courts continue to rule or continue to uphold the California rule. Hmm. So with, with that in place, it is unlikely that there will be any further opportunity for pension reform. So the pension reform that the state did a number of years ago, we refer to it as PEPRA, um, the Public Employee Pension Reform Act of California. It really, it made a lot of good changes, uh, but they were for new employees that came into the system. And as of right now, after the number of years that you know, since Pepper was enacted, we think that we've got about another 15 years before the old employees cycle through the system. And we, and, but even with that said, we have realized some pension savings as a result of our Pepper employees, but that savings will continue to grow over time. And again, I think we're, we've got about another 15 years before we really see that cycle through. Afrin, this is Scott, and um, we do have a question that came in through the chat feature, Carl. I'm sorry to, it's also related to pensions though. So um, the question is, uh, does that employment rule change if the city goes bankrupt? Um, it, it, well, yes and no. The, the actual California rule itself does not change. But if the city were to go bankrupt, we've seen it happen with other agencies. Um, what happens is that the um, uh, CalPERS are the, the administrator of our pension plan that most cities use. CalPERS becomes a creditor in that bank's bankruptcy proceeding. 
and for whatever reason, they are able to get pretty much the first seat at the table. Um, if a, an agency is absolutely unable to pay, and this happened with a little joint powers authority in San Gabriel Valley, um, it, it shut down or, and it had a few retirees that it was paying for, and it simply stopped paying its CalPERS bill. And those employees, their pensions were basically cut. So maybe one month they got $2,000 and then the next month they got 400. So that's what happens if an agency cannot pay its bill to CalPERS is that the retirees will um, immediately have their pensions cut significantly. Oh. Very interesting. Carl, I, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. I'm just, just letting you know. Yes, yeah, I've looked at it also. And yeah, I don't have any any either. So uh, on it, um, on it. I, um, I guess with that, Catherine, I wanna thank you for, for, for being with us and thank you for the input. And most importantly, thank you for watching over us because I, I do like these, the, you guys looking ahead and saying, this is what we're gonna do. I guess the one quest, last question I was going to ask, the uh, police station and the jail, how much of a write-off is that? It, it ends in, in 2024, all our bonds are paid. Mm -hmm. How much money per year is that that we're paying? Nine, nine million. Nine million, okay. So mm -hmm. that'll be a, a expenditure that we won't have to make after 2024. That is true. Okay. And thank you for having me tonight. Very nice good. presentation. Very good presentation. Thank, thank you on it. Uh, with that, uh, I don't think we're going to end up uh, getting Daniel, so we'll save him for the next meeting. And our next meeting is going to be on November 19th, uh, before one week before Thanksgiving, and that's a week earlier than normal because of Thanksgiving. So with that, uh, I want to thank everybody for part participating and those that tuned in and wish everybody a very good night and uh, happy ha ha Halloween. We'll see you on the 19th of November. Thank you. Thank you, Carl Bellinger. <laughs> Bellinger. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're in Germany, then it's a binier. <laughs>